Well, what what you discovered there was that that uh, I still live more or less in about 1943 as far as my, uh, my where I am technologically. <laughs> I tell you what, guys, I am fresh off of the movie premiere from the Millionaire's Unit, and if you have not seen the film yet, you, you have to. That's all there is to it. So I went up to the Santa Monica Airport to the Museum of Flying, which Derek and Ron had rented out for the L.A. premiere of the documentary, and it was a huge success, just like you'd expect any L.A. movie premiere to be. And a huge shout-out to the museum for hosting that event. Now, I hadn't met either of these guys before we recorded the last episode, and it was so cool to sit down with them in person uh, during the premiere, and they were each just beaming with pride over the film, and I, I wish you could all have been there with me. And you know what? You actually kind of can, and that's because I brought my camera with me, and I filmed a little vlog about the whole trip, and you can go check that out on my YouTube channel. There's, of course, a link in the show notes. And while you're there, I'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't mind hitting that subscribe button, because I'm planning to take my camera with me pretty much everywhere from now on, so I can make a ton of fun aviation content for you guys all to enjoy, completely free. And also, you know, one of the funniest parts of the night, and yes, don't worry, it's in the video, was when I had to run out to find an ATM at 9 o'clock at night in Santa Monica, and that's so I could pay uh, the author of the book for the signed copy that he sold me. Uh, whoops. Anyway, it turns out that he is one really cool guy, and he actually agreed to do an interview with me for the podcast. And that's what we have today. The man, the myth, the legend himself, renowned author, academic, and historian, Mark Wortman. And he's the guy who actually wrote the Millionaire's Unit book. And if you like the film, you just have to get a copy of the book, too. Because reading the book, you know, it opens up so much more about each of the characters. And it even exposes a couple stories that even a two-hour documentary just can't cover. But most importantly, as you listen and as you read the book, you're going to feel the passion for writing that Mark has. And it's no different than the way that we all feel about all things aviation. All right, Mel. Well, so when it, you know you say you're kind of technologically like in in 1943, that seems to be like a part of history that that really resonates with you. Uh, is that true? Uh, well, I've all, when I say I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the past, um, it's in some ways that's just just a rejection of of some of what's going on in the present here with uh, you know the way in which technology is kind of swept us all into a great big vortex and where we're we're all trying to figure out what's going on in the meanwhile we're spinning as fast as we possibly can and the great thing about history about studying history is you can get perspective on a different era and when you look uh, and in looking back on that different era you can also get perspective on our present time you know i think i think a lot of us just feel completely overwhelmed with all the information that's coming at us constantly. And when we look back at the past and uh, look at the way in which society reacted to what are in many cases many similar types of, of uh, situations, uh, demands on individuals, uh, crises, you know, that uh, uh, how they handled them and how they reacted to them, what they were seeing and perceiving, you know, that gives us uh, a, a handle that we can, I think, usefully use on the present. And, uh, and I think uh, one of the really bad things that's happened in American society is um, America allows people to live outside of history, um, to believe that there's only the present and there's only the future. Uh, and other places in the world... Uh, Think about Europe, but really anywhere you go in the world, uh, the past is uh, something that carries over, and they understand themselves to be part of a continuum. And uh, so I, you know, I wish Americans had more of a sense of where they came from, uh, why, uh, what they can learn from the past, um, how to, uh, as a way to avoid mistakes. I mean, we. American society seems to recycle the same issues, the same mistakes over and over again. Um, and it would just help us so much to spend a little bit of time 
thinking about how these things were dealt with in the past. Anyway, I'm up on a soapbox there. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. This is the perfect place to be on that. No, and, and you know that's that's kind of where I'm going. Is 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 that something that motivated you to be a writer in the first place? Um, well, there there are a variety of different things that took me into writing. Um, one is simply I love language. Um, I love. Um, I should say that uh, I didn't start out as a, a as a historian professionally. I was. Um, uh, I actually started out uh, going into academia. Uh, I was. I got a, a degree in literature. Uh, I studied uh, 19th century American and German literature. Seems sort of far away from uh, the the books on war and society that I've written, but. Um, you know, I came to love story. I came to love uh, how the past could inform us, and uh, and just the the beauty of language. I really care about every word I put down on the page, and I think about every word that I put down on the page. And uh, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, and we can I can tell that as I was as I was reading the Millionaires Unit. Um, you know, I saw the documentary, of course, first, and then that's how mm-hmm. I, I learned about the book and everything like that. And and as I read. Uh, the actual book itself, I, I, w- I found myself drawn in so quickly to the way that you you wrote about these guys and, and their their early years at Yale and then, you know, how they moved on and, and really changed changed the future. So, yeah, I can really tell the, the passion in your writing. Mm, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I think about like uh, my uh, most recent book, uh, 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, about the period before U.S. entry into uh, World War II. Um, you know, I, I remember very specifically how much I agonized over the first sentence or the first two or three sentences. And, uh, it starts out with a description of a caravan of journalists going from Berlin to the front in Poland, uh, uh, taken there by the Nazi propaganda ministry. This was in September 1939. And uh, I just thought it was so important to get a sense of what it was like to be in this, uh, in this, in the vehicles, in these trucks and cars that are driving upstream as the Nazi tanks are actually coming back from the front and the soldiers are coming back from the front and what that felt like and what it was like to be dodging around uh, potholes in the road and smelling uh, the remains from the battles that had been fought there. Um, and you just, you have to get the words right. And and when I think back about writing the Millionaire's Unit, you know, we're talking, uh, it's been... Uh, uh, God, more than 10 years now. Um, You know, it was really important to get uh, the sense of what it was like to be sitting in the cockpit when you're up at uh, 15,000 feet and it's icy, bitter cold. And there's this, uh, if you stick your face out just a little bit above the the, uh, cowling of the aircraft, you're going to get this wind that will instantly give you frostbite. And at the same time, you've, you've got hypoxia. You're, you're, uh, you're in danger of losing consciousness. And you're, as a result, you've got this terrible headache. And, uh, the, uh, engine exhaust is kind of coming at you. And meanwhile, you're, you know, you're potentially getting anti-aircraft fire and you're always looking around constantly, constantly searching left, right, up and down for, uh, for aircraft that are sort of just pinpricks against the sky, uh, or hidden against the landscape below you. And just this, you want to get that, that tactile feel into words and it really matters what words you use. Uh, as long as well as getting it historically right, factually accurate, and that's that's a uh, that's a big challenge. It takes it takes a lot of work to do that. Absolutely, you know, in a lot of uh, audio and video production, there's an old saying that just goes, "Don't let perfection get in the way of good enough." But obviously, mm-hmm. that that does not apply to you. Well, um, 
you, you have deadlines. You got to get the book out. Um, uh, you know, when you think about, uh, about any subject, uh, you can go down s- such a long alley uh, looking for information, looking for facts. And in some cases, it's just not there. And at a certain point, you just, you have to stop and you have to get, you have to write with what you've got. You know, so, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of these people who sits there and, and, uh, takes, you know, uh, weeks to write a sentence. Um, I'm somebody who, who believes pretty firmly you want to get the book out there and you want to, um, you know, and when I talk about that language, um, you also ha- always have to keep the reader in mind. You know, what's it going to be? What's the experience going to be for the reader? You know, you don't want to lose your reader. You want you want to make your reader want to turn the page, and uh, that's that's the big challenge for the kind of of writing that I do. You know, I don't write books aimed at academic audiences. Um, I write books that are aimed at general readers. Um, you know, it can even be, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the the reader I most want to reach is the reader who is just looking for a great book to read, uh, uh, to learn a little bit about a period of history, and most importantly, to get swept up in the book. And so you, uh, you want to write uh, sentences and paragraphs and s- chapters and entire narratives that keep people reading, that capture them, that make them want to turn the page. You know, that's, that's a big challenge. And, and, uh, you know, when you talk, uh, you, you talk about coming to the book from, from the, uh, from the, the documentary there, you know, part of what I do as a writer is try to think about my book, uh, in a some, in a somewhat similar way to the way, uh, somebody would think about, uh, putting, uh, uh, a story on the screen. You know, because, you know, uh, there's, there are, of course, many things you can do in a book that you could never do in a two-hour movie. Um, but you, you want to be able to, to uh, have that sense of, of um, narrative uncertainty, intrigue, uh, caring about the characters, um, wondering what's going to happen to them. And keeping some element of mystery going the whole way, um, and that you know some of that is sure. Now there was there was one thing I wanted to actually ask you about that. Um, w- when you write a book, do you actually you say you kind of have the maybe like the way that it would be turned into a movie in mind? But do you ever write books intending for them to be turned into a film? Uh, out and out, no, no. You're you're um, you know only in the sense that some of the techniques that you use in writing a book are going to be similar uh, to what uh, it takes to make a, a, a good movie. Um, you want, you know, you want strong characters. You want uh, a, a, a plot through line. I mean, in some ways, that's the beauty of <laughs> the beauty and the horror of war that there's uh, there's a natural chronology to it, and there's a and there's a great drama to it. You know, uh, what is it that carries that takes people to war? What's what are the uh, passions that go into it? What are the uh, the big issues, and what's going to happen? You know, when nations go to war, they think they're going to win. You know, uh, during World War One, every nation that went into it was convinced they were going to win the war and they were going to win it fast. You know, they didn't envision anything like what very quickly ensued, which was from uh, from August 1914 uh, when it started into November when it became this terrible, terrible stalemate along the Western Front. And then this war of attrition resulted that just 
where basically it was just a question of which nation would bleed dry the fastest. And in this case, they meant literally bleed the other nation dry. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you want to capture that, that feel and that flavor and that, uh, and that sense of, of excitement that goes with war and terror and fear. Um, and, uh, and then how it actually unfolds in reality, you know, um, and that's, so that, that all circles back to what is it, you know, how do you think about it in terms of film versus, uh, versus uh, a book? Um, you know, as I said, there, there are just all these elements that, that they do share, um, but a book allows you to get inside people's heads in a way you can, never really can in a film and to uh, expand on things. You know, um, the, the Millionaire's Unit documentary uh, is, you know, a solid two hours long and really explores things in, in, in extremely well visually. It's, it's really a, an extraordinary film. I mean, they, they did amazing things. Um, but there are so many stories that I was capable of telling in a, um, 300 page book that they can't do in a two hour movie. So many paths, um, uh, so many um, events that they they couldn't talk about at all. I mean, there was uh, uh, members of the Millionaires Unit, uh, the first Yale unit, who were uh, went down at sea, and they uh, their aircraft was disabled at sea, and they were absolutely convinced uh, they were at sea for several days, and their aircraft was falling apart, and they were absolutely convinced that they were uh, dying at sea. Um, and, uh, it's this extraordinary moment where these guys are out there and they're, um, and they're writing notes, uh, about, you know, to, to their family and, uh, and friends talking about, you know, uh, that uh, there's one that's uh, who wrote, um, and when you, when you find us, please know that we were game to the end, you know, and it's just a sense of, of, you know, here at this most extreme moment, uh, who they were. And as it happened, as their plane was literally breaking apart, um, a vessel found them and brought them in. Um, and there's an, there's another scene that didn't get into the film where one of the, uh, first young unit members was, uh, at the, uh, school of flying in Gosport, which was kind of the top gun school where the, um, most elite pilots were brought in for training. Um, and they were really fortunate because they got far more extensive training than typical, typical, uh, World War I pilot got. Most of those World War I pilots had, you know, if they were lucky, were, had 15 hours of training, uh, maybe a few, uh, just a few of them solo, and then they were sent to the front. And, you know, the basic idea was go to the front and if you're, uh, if you're lucky and survive for a while, you'll figure it out. Um, but uh, a few of the of the elite pilots, including a number of members of the first Yale unit, went to the School of Flying in Gosport, England. Um, and they uh, and one of the members of the Yale unit, uh, a guy named Shorty Smith, was in a two seater um, and by himself. And he was in the, uh, in the rear cockpit and he was looping the loop and, a a, a, um, a strap from, uh, the front cockpit flipped over into his cockpit. He didn't realize it and, um, basically hooked onto his yoke and he couldn't, he couldn't control the aircraft anymore. And it just kept looping the loop and he was about 3000 feet up and he's looping over and over again as the airplane is getting closer and closer to the ground. And, uh, it's this extraordinary moment where he's knows that he is slowly going over and over and over and flipping over. And eventually he's just going to smash into the ground. Um, uh, and, at a certain, uh, just before he smashed into the ground, he 
he managed to cut his engine on his last loop and to to make a hard landing and survived. But it basically uh, rendered him incapable of being a pilot anymore. It just like he was so traumatized by the experience and that never got into the into the movie but uh you know there are these extraordinary moments that um that you have the privilege of sort of writing at length about in a book and in a movie there they things have to move and they have to move very fast sure okay well i'll tell you what now might be a good time to talk about um in the intro you brought up the leadership privilege that these these gentlemen felt and you know we touched on it of course uh with with derek and ron but the idea that you know these guys didn't have to do this like they didn't have to to go to war and fight they didn't have to you know do any of it they they were they were from the wealthiest families i mean they could have done whatever they wanted but they they somehow felt a a duty or or a, a leadership privilege as you call it in the book can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah yeah well one of the, one of the ways i thought about the book was was to think about it as how do we how does how has American society created leaders? You know, what are, um, and, uh, you know, a sort of working subtitle in my mind was leaders in their youth. You know, where, where did they come from? How did they get here? Um, because the ones who survived ended up being, you know, major figures in the rise of U S air power, uh, in, in, uh, uh, through world war two and into the cold war. Um, uh, both commercially and uh, and uh, most importantly militarily, um, so I, I you know they and I knew they had experienced it. They'd been there. They 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 got to know it when they were young, um, and that was so important when when World War II came around. Um, but what what they had experienced as young men was was this interesting combination of uh, really the most extraordinary wealth. Uh, these were the guys uh, at the end of, of the Gilded Age whose parents you know, were Wall Streeters. Uh, uh, one was the head of the J.P. Morgan Bank. Another was father was the head of the Union Pacific Railroad. There was a Rockefeller. There was a Taft. I mean, these guys were powerful, came from immensely powerful families, immensely privileged families. And, and they had been taught that, uh, that with that privilege came a big responsibility. And the responsibility was to get out in front and lead. Um, and they, you know, they really wanted to be the first into the fight. You know, it's, it's, it's such a different world that they occupied. Um, and I wanted to understand what is it what is it that was took place in their educations that made them think in that way um, and there were all kinds of aspects to that uh, m- most of them were athletes most of them had been uh, had a real sense of competition uh, they also grew up in a time of uh, when intellectual life was played down um, you know, we think of a place like Yale or Harvard now as these, uh, great, uh, centers of, of education and knowledge and research and learning. And most of these kids, and, and we can't forget they were kids, had during their prep school years, cause they all went to prep school, uh, had, um, basically done their learning. And when they got to a place like Yale, what they spent a lot of their time doing was being social, was um, uh, working for organizations, uh, playing their sports. Um, you know, somebody like Rob, Robert Lovett, who became uh, the, the, the one who... Uh, designed America's first strategic bomber force. And then at at the ripe age of 23, uh, led the night wing of the U.S. first strategic bomber force. He had 1,200 men under him. Um, And 
during World War II, he came back and he was the head of the War Department's uh, Assistant Secretary of War for Air. You know, this was before the uh, uh, Department of Defense came in. And so he was a person who was responsible for creating the Army Air Forces. And uh, then in, World, uh, in the Korean War, he was the Secretary of Defense. Um, and this was a guy who, when he was at Yale, you know, he was uh, he was a brilliant guy, but he spent a lot of time doing things like uh, being involved in the Yale Dramatic Society and uh, running the uh, uh, prom for his class. You know, these things that you don't think of as it, as anything other than kind of um, uh, fun stuff for kids to do. Well, those were training grounds for how to get along with people, how to lead people, how to organize things, you know, and that translated for him when he got into World War I uh, into uh, bringing people together in other situations uh, and to create, uh, to design uh, this new bomber force. Um, so, uh, you know, there were all these elements that went into, into what it took uh, to become a leader. Uh, they were also, they were inspired by uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was, uh, lived, a number of these uh, kids grew, uh, grew up or summered on the North Shore of Long Island, the Gold Coast, you know, uh, what uh, the area uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about in, uh, later in The Great Gatsby. Um, and um, Teddy Roosevelt, lived along the shore there and he was a real presence in their life uh and teddy roosevelt's son quentin uh who was sadly killed in uh in the first world war as an army aviator was friends with a number of these guys had gone to uh uh prep school with with some of them and uh was sort of a regular in their social circles so they knew teddy roosevelt um and so they knew sort of what to aspire to and what, what the model they had in mind was uh, for how to be a man of action and a leader uh, and, uh, and a thoughtful person at the same time. You know, as I look through your website here, markwortmanbooks.com, I'm, I'm noticing that all of your other books that I actually can't wait to read here, they, they have a, a theme going through them. And actually, there's two themes. The first one is war. Uh, World War One and Two, and then the second one is uh, American air power in those wars. Uh, you really, mm -hmm. obviously, have a, a passion for for war, and I'm sure it goes uh, far beyond just the fact that it's a treasure trove of great stories to write about. But can you tell us a little bit about that? Um. Well, you know, like uh, everybody from my generation, baby boomer generation, uh, I grew up in the shadow of World War II. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was just this awareness of how much uh, that war had shaped American society and the world. And so there was always a curiosity about it. Um, at the same time, there was a personal element to it that, you know, my father was a, uh, just an ordinary GI in, in World War II. Uh, he and all of his friends had gone overseas, um, either to the Pacific or to Europe. And, uh, you know, they, very few of them were willing to talk much about what they'd experienced. So there was always this curiosity about trying to get at what that was about. Uh, I also, I grew up in the Washington DC area and, uh, you can't grow up there without having this real palpable sense of, you know, of history, uh, and in so many ways. Um, and you didn't mention that I actually, I wrote a book about, uh, uh the rise and fall of Atlanta and the civil war, uh, called the bonfire. And, uh, again, the, the, uh, growing up there on, on the borderland, on the borderline between North and South, uh, you're, it was, you were very much aware of, you know, that across the river was once the Confederacy and, uh, about, 
an hour's drive from where I lived, was the battlefield where the most uh, where more Americans were lost on in one day of fighting than uh, at any other time in history. And if you, I could literally ride my bike over where Confederate soldiers had uh, had marched into Washington and and uh, where Abraham Lincoln had uh, nearly been shot during a, a Confederate raid on Washington. You know, so uh, there was very much an awareness of, of war as something both uh, uh, important for the entire world, uh, nationally important, and personally important. Uh, and then, you know, like every kid uh, or every boy back then, uh, you know, war was just this thing we did, <laughs> thing we thought about. Now, I didn't, I didn't end up going into the military. Uh, I grew up in the, um, uh, or came of age in the post-Vietnam era. Um, and that was a period of, of, uh, of peace and a period when, um, my, uh, uh, cohort and I had the good fortune that, um, nobody was, uh, was requiring us to make a decision about, you know, whether we, uh, should be going into the military or not. Uh, but anyway, uh, and then on top of that, uh, there are just these great stories. And uh, as soon as, you know, I, I should tell you where the, the Millionaire's Unit book came from. Uh, I was a journalist um, and wrote an article about the uh, history of aviation at Yale University. Um, and Yale... Uh, is a place that had this long and deep history in aviation. Uh, and I went flying with the current version of the Yale Flying Club, uh, which was uh, founded in, I think it was in like 1966. And it was founded by a guy named, uh, who was an undergraduate at the time, a guy named Fred Smith. Uh, and uh, Fred Smith uh, after uh, uh, his time at Yale, served as a, uh, a Marine pilot in Vietnam. And then he uh, came home and he uh, founded FedEx and, you know, became another uh, aviation pioneer. And Fred uh, was um, uh, very much cut from the same cloth as these guys. Uh, in fact, he was a member of Skull and Bones, you know, the famous Yale Secret Senior Society that a lot of these guys were in. And, uh, you know, Fred was, uh, um, you know, drew upon many of his, uh, his classmates just like, uh, just like they did to, to build up FedEx. And um, not coincidentally, FedEx ended up being, uh, uh, being one of the sponsors and supporters for the, the Millionaire's Unit film. I mean, that was a personal choice made by Fred Smith to, uh, to back the film. So as you were writing uh, The Millionaire's Unit, did you have any idea that somebody would um, pick up on that and make a film out of it? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, uh, did I, did I, uh, I should say, does one hope that somebody's going to make a, a film out of, out of a book? You know, every, every author, no matter what they uh, say, always has uh, some dream in there that says, uh, wouldn't that be, make for a great movie? Um, and the, uh, the, uh, so here's a, here's a little bit of um, uh, Hollywood dope here. Um, even before my book came out, it was actually optioned to be made into a feature motion picture by a uh, terrific English-based uh, studio called Working Title. Uh, Working Title has made, um, I, most recently, they did Darkest Hour, uh, the uh, uh, Churchill uh, movie about the, actually, the period that figures importantly in my uh, my most recent book, 1941. Um, and they've, they've done a number of really great, significant, fun movies, Hollywood movies and, uh, 
smaller movies. Um, and they optioned the Millionaire's Unit to make it into a feature motion picture, which was like, wow, this is this is an amazing thing for a writer uh, putting out his first book. Um, so the and things seemed to be mo moving full speed ahead. And then uh, a movie appeared kind of out of nowhere. Um, it had been uh, go in production sort of on the quiet uh, called Flyboys. I don't know if you uh, have seen it. Uh, it's a movie about Americans in World War I fighting with the French. It's kind of loosely based on the story of the Lafayette Escadrille. Um, and it, so when they heard or when they realized this movie was going to come out, they put the brakes on what they were doing with the Millionaire's Unit and waited to see what would happen. And unfortunately, that movie did very poorly. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, uh, my personal opinion of it was it deserved to do very poorly. And the Millionaire's Unit would have been so much better. You know, my, my, uh, the book w was just such a natural for, um, uh, for being made into a Hollywood movie. But unfortunately that movie came out, it did poorly and they shelved, uh, the Millionaire's Unit. Um, there was another producer who picked it up for a brief period and then, uh, again, dropped the option. Um, and th so it, when, um, uh, you know, when I, so when I wrote the book, uh, of course the, you know, it's a dream to get something made into a movie and it rarely, rarely happens. Uh, I'm good friends with a guy named Nathaniel Philbrick. Uh, writer, terrific historian, and he wrote a book called In the Heart of the Sea that won the National Book Award. It's uh, about uh, the stoving of a whale ship by a, uh, by a whale and then the, um, uh, what happened to the survivors, and it uh, fed into the eventual writing uh, of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And uh, that book came out in, I think it was like, yeah, sometime around 2000, maybe 2001, it took 15 years before it was ever made into a movie. Um, and it went through many iterations. And there are just like, there's so many things that happen in Hollywood. You're in LA, so you know better than I do about these things. You know, um, there are just a thousand factors that can derail a uh, um, a movie and very few factors that can actually get one made. So um, when Ron King uh, came to me and said, hey, does is anybody making a documentary about the Millionaire's Unit? You know, there was nothing going on at that point, And I was just ecstatic that he had the interest. And so, uh, you know, I just said, uh, go for it. Um, and you know, it took him a long, long time, uh, together with Derek Greer, to get it done. Uh, as as your listeners know, um, but it was a, it was a a great thing to have them uh, want to do it. Yeah, tell me about how that worked. When uh, I mean, Ron kind of told his version of it. You know, when he saw the book in the bookstore and got the idea. But um, tell me about what it was like to be approached by these two gentlemen to to actually make the film, especially now, because um, I wasn't aware of of you know that it had possibly been made into a film before and then shelved. So given that, that information now, what was it like when somebody yet again came up and approached you about making the film? How did you feel? Well, um, you know, there's a big difference when uh, an individual comes up to you and says, hey, I'd like to do a movie. And when um, a, a film studio comes to you and says, uh, we, with our great power and money, wants to make a movie. So uh, when, you know, when Ron approached me um, as an individual, uh, I just thought, well, more power to you. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm happy to sign over rights and, and uh, let, you, uh, let you pursue this. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is a... Uh, uh, has the potential to be a, a fun adventure. You know, at the same time, of course, I'm, I'm, 
um, go into this in a, in a somewhat skeptical way uh, that, you know, I know how, what it takes or I, I know something of what it takes to get uh, something on the screen. Uh, and, you know, my assumption was uh, that Ron and Derek would do a pretty small film, something, um, you know, something that would uh, run potentially an hour that would uh, seek to uh, just use uh, available uh, visual materials and, uh, you know, be a um, something that potentially had uh, uh, a rich but small focused uh, quality to it um, at its best. Um, and what I didn't realize was the stick to itness of these two guys and their, uh, and really their, their incredible talent and, and uh, endurance. You know, the, they spent, uh, you know, years, longer than it took me to write the book, longer than it took to fight World War I uh, to get the, the thing on screen. And uh, what they got on screen is, is amazing. I, I honestly never expected it to be as good, as rich, as deep, uh, as engaging as, as what they managed to do. Uh, so, um, you know, when, uh, so, uh, I'm, you know, I'm somebody who, who says, who, who believes, okay, if somebody wants to do something, um, let them try to do it, uh, encourage them as much as you can. Um, and, uh, and certainly, you know, in this case, uh, with Ron, I, I did, and, and eventually Derek, I did everything I could to help them. We had a, I'm sure they, uh, they probably told you we had an event at the Yale club in New York city. And there were lots and lots of the families of the members, uh, descendants of the first Yale unit members, and they had materials there. And you began to realize there was this sort of, um, network of people, uh, some of whom knew each other, many of whom didn't for the filmmakers became really important because they were, they had visual materials, uh, which uh, are so essential to making a film in a way that for a book, you know, for a book, you have uh, the opportunity to put a, uh, some maps and some photographs uh, in, uh, in, uh, on paper into the book, you know, but uh, in a film, you have to put uh, uh, historical materials of all kinds and all of it visual and engaging and be able to tell a story. So you have to know that, that these things are there. Um, and they, so they began to see that they had all this material that had the, the potential to become a film, um, and to feed into, into this narrative. Um, and so they, uh, you know, I think they got excited about it at that point and really, uh, were ready to run with it. And so I basically just said, go for it. I handed over, you know, I gave them rights to, to work on it and, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't get anything out of the movie except the joy of, of, of seeing this, this amazing finished product that they put on the screen. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and sort of the, uh, the great thing about it for an author when there's a film is that obviously a film is far more accessible to people than a book. A lot of people don't read, um, and the time it takes to read a book, is, the commitment is much greater than it takes to watch a two-hour film. And so the film goes around to places uh, where occasionally I get to tag along. And, uh, you know, like at that uh, event at the Santa Monica Museum of Flying. And, and that for me is, is just a great, fun thing to do. I've been to, uh, with... Uh, them for screening at uh, Oshkosh at the um, Air Venture uh, Air Show, and they they screened it screened it uh, in this open air theater, 
And beforehand, there's uh, Sully Sullenberger of the um, of flight, uh, is it flight 92? The, um, uh, 1549. 1549, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, who's there to promote the, the film. And so I get to meet him. And uh, there's an event there where um, this, where Robert Hoover, Bob Hoover, uh, it was still alive. And uh, I, I got to, to meet him and sit and talk with him. And what a wonderful, amazing man. Uh, and so, the, you know, the film in itself has just been a real gift. It's just taken me to all kinds of places uh, and uh, in, in ways that uh, the book alone couldn't. Although the book did bring me, uh, you know, into all, into very interesting and, and uh, in some cases really fun uh, uh, circumstances. Um, you know, I've, I've communicated with uh, 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 George Bush, President George Bush, uh, 41, uh, the first uh, President Bush, uh, because he was inspired by these guys to go into Navy aviation himself. His uh, father, Senator Prescott Bush, was uh, more or less in the same uh, uh, class years at Yale with these guys, also in Skull and Bones, you know, the, the senior society there. And so um, uh, his son got to know them and he knew they were naval aviators. And when the U.S. went into uh, World War II, uh, he joined up right away in Navy aviation. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, you know, we communicated about that because I wanted to find out some, some uh, aspects of what that was like and what it meant for him to know these guys who were out there. You know, you mentioned a minute ago, and I, I didn't want this to go unnoticed. Did, did you actually say that The Millionaire's Unit was your first book? Yes, it was. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. When I, as I read it, there, the, like, there's no way this is the work of like the, this is somebody's first book. I mean, it, it's, it is not written like anybody's first effort at anything. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I had been uh, a writer and journalist for years. Uh, and, and, um, you know, I, some of the ways in which you write a feature article for magazines, you know, I've written for Vanity Fair, I've written for Smithsonian, uh, I've written for Air and Space Magazine and many other places. Um, and what you try to do in a feature article, uh, isn't that different, uh, than a book. You know, your uh, feature article is in, could in some ways be seen as a uh, drastically boiled down book. Uh, you you want to get people in. You want to get them reading. You want to uh, inform them. And you want them to get to know characters. And you want to use characters to tell stories. And uh, to, uh, so that uh, by the end, there's a satisfaction of having learned about lives other than our own, uh, to be informed about uh, some aspect of humanity that matters, and to have done it in a way that's uh, engaging and hopefully entertaining. You know, uh, and those tools, which are sort of the the journalist tools. Uh, maybe the, the novel writer's tools in some cases, uh, those are the same tools that go into writing uh, a nonfiction history, a narrative history. Uh, and I distinguish a narrative history from, uh, you know, the kind of thing that uh, a David McCullough does or Nathaniel Philbrick or Doris Kearns Goodwin um, or Edmund Morris. Uh, I distinguish that from... Uh, uh, academic books, uh, some of which are absolutely tremendous and very engaging, uh, but academic books are often engaged in a, in an argument, a professional argument within a, uh, the discipline of history. Uh, and they are more concerned with what, how they are uh, presenting evidence in an argument than they are with um, 
taking the reader through character and narrative and plot, um, which is, you know, which is the area. Sure. And you, you mentioned humanity a, a little bit ago and bringing that into it. Um, I think that you've pretty well mastered that, that idea of combining both accurate historical events, but also bringing that, that level to it. And in that line of thinking, what, what character in the millionaire's unit would you say resonates with you the most? Uh, that's, uh, that's a great question because uh, in some ways it's hard not to love them all. Sure. Uh, because uh, I mean, there were some of the, some of these guys had uh, definitely had flaws. Uh, they were part of their times. Uh, the the racism, uh, in some cases, anti-Semitism that I saw in their letters uh, was um, you know was was very much of their time, um, but. The book itself began with uh, when I read the letters of Kenneth McLeish. Uh, or I should say it, it actually began when I started uh, learning about the first Yale unit. I mentioned uh, that I had gone, done this article on uh, aviation at Yale and uh, went flying with the, the, new, the current fly, Yale Flying Club, and they told me about this uh, predecessor group that had been one of the very earliest campus flying clubs. Uh, and I started looking into it for that article and I began to realize, wow, this is an amazing story in itself. So little known. You know, I knew a fair amount about uh, military history and about uh, yeah, World War I and about aviation history. And I knew nothing about these guys. And there hadn't been anything significant published about them since uh, the 1920s. And so I, I looked into it further, and uh, I found uh, there's a great book compilation of letters that Kenneth MacLeish wrote uh, during World War I. Uh, it's, it's compiled by a uh, terrific historian of uh, World War I aviation, uh, Jeffrey Rosano, and it's called The Price of Honor, uh, a compilation I highly recommend. And uh, Kenneth MacLeish was uh, the brother of Archibald MacLeish. Archibald MacLeish was later a three-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize in writing, uh, and uh, he had some of his brother's gifts in writing. And these letters, which are mostly letters to his fiance back home, uh, but there are also some letters to his family. Uh, the these letters are extraordinary because they're, uh, they're, they tell the story of this young kid. He's a, a Yale College junior. Uh, so he's about 20 years old, going on 21, when he gets caught up in this campus flying club that's going to teach him how to fly. But they know that the purpose of learning to fly is to go to war, you know. The U.S. had no aviation, uh, military aviation uh, force to speak of. And so they were forming their own private militia air force. And then you read his, um, his letters about uh, his fir the first time he soloed and just what a release it was, what an extraordinary experience it was for this kid uh, who had been in this really kind of hemmed in world. Back then, when you were when you were wealthy, you had big opportunities. But at the same time, you were very narrowly constricted in what you had to do. And uh, suddenly, you're flying above the world by yourself in an aircraft, and it's all on you. And it was all on Kenny. And and he knew it, and he loved it, and he. Uh, and so then I started reading uh, the rest of the letters, and he's talking in his letters about uh, this mission he was on. Uh, he had an observer, uh, and they were flying over occupied Belgium, and they, their aircraft got shot up, uh, got hit by any aircraft fire, and they lost control, and they lost power. And while he's struggling uh, as a pilot to regain control of the aircraft, they go sailing out over Holland. And Holland was, during, uh, during the First World War, was a neutral 
country. And if they had ditched there, uh, they would have been interned. He wouldn't have been able to return to the fighting, but uh, he would have survived. He would have been in the, uh, he would have spent the rest of the war there uh, and been able to come home and be uh, treated as uh, a returning veteran, uh, an aviation hero in many ways. But instead, he managed to regain partial control of the aircraft. Uh, he got the engine working back again, although it was only on a few cylinders. And he turns the aircraft around and he flies back over Belgium, where he's going to get shot at again with uh, anti-aircraft fire. And he manages to get back to base to live and fight another day. And I just thought, wow, that's an amazing story. He talked about this in his letters. And I just thought, what, a, what an... Uh, uh, what kind of idealism and uh, passion did it take for him to to brave turning that thing around uh, and getting back? And so that, that really kind of swept me into the story. And it was really from there that I said, wow, this is, this is a book that needs to be done. And, uh, you know, and then I started, uh, I started talking, uh, I went out and got in touch with families, uh, descendants. And, you know, these, these guys were very well educated. They wrote beautiful letters. Uh, and then they, uh, uh, and they knew they were at, at something new and extraordinary. Uh, and so they, uh, they were really keen on keeping a record of what they were experiencing, what they were doing. Uh, and so there was just, there was all the makings of, of a great book here. And, and as they say, the rest is history. Oh, well, and a great book, it sure was. Uh, tell me about some of your other writings. I actually just read one of your pieces in um, Air and Space magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well... Uh, that piece, uh, actually, I don't know if you, uh, met them at the, uh, at the premiere or the screening at the Santa Monica Museum of Flying. Uh, I met for the first time a guy, a guy named Phil Hart and his wife, Tanya. And Phil is the great nephew of James Herman Banning. James Herman Banning and Thomas Allen were the two, Af or the first two African Americans to fly across the country. Uh, this was in 1932. So it was uh, um, almost 20 years after the first white flyer had made it across the country. But what they did was to make this flight in the midst of Jim Crow. Uh, and uh, when uh, Americans simply, white America, simply didn't believe it was possible for African Americans to fly. Uh, and they, uh, the, and where it was actually dangerous for these guys to land in an airport or land in a field somewhere, because they didn't know who was going to be there, or what they would say. Um, so I wrote an article about this flight for um, Air and Space magazine. Um, and uh, Phil Hart, uh, the great nephew, is uh, uh, he, uh, involved in the film industry and in LA and he's, he's actually, uh, attempting to produce a movie about his great uncle. And he's done some books and documentaries about, uh, about African American aviators. So, um, that was a great thing for me to meet him there in person for the first time. We talked on the phone a number of times and emailed many, many times. So, um, so I write, uh, I've written articles uh, for many magazines uh, uh, on many different subjects. I tend to focus, of course, on historical subjects. Uh, uh, my, uh, let's see, most recently in Vanity Fair, I did something on uh, the, uh, on Casablanca and uh, the movie Casablanca and, and the real Casablanca. We just passed the uh, 75th anniversary of, of, the U.S. invasion of North Africa during uh, World War II, our first uh, real engagement with uh, with Nazi forces and the um, in the liberation of Europe, and uh, I did a piece on uh, how 
what was going on in North Africa was presented in the movie Casablanca. Um, and uh, my book, 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, part of it was uh, actually excerpted by Vanity Fair as well. Um, and uh, so I, I, I write about, you know, a variety of subjects on, but in war and society principally. Um, my, uh, my book, um, uh, The Bonfire, uh, which is about the rise and fall of Atlanta in the Civil War, ranges quite widely over uh, how Atlanta, you know, which we know perhaps best from Gone with the Wind uh, uh, from that period, um, how Atlanta, which wasn't on the map 15 years before the Civil War, how it became uh, the, the major target in the Deep South for Union forces and uh, what really happened there, kind of a true story of Gone with the Wind. And in the course of doing that book, I came across uh, the story of a slave in Atlanta, somebody named Robert Webster, who was the, uh, who became uh, one of the wealthiest people in Atlanta as a slave during the Civil War. And it's this amazing story. And I ended up uh, the descendants of the family that owned him. You know, it's kind of a horrible thing to say now that one human being owning another human being. But that was the reality. Uh, that family got in touch with me because they had a photograph of him. Uh, and uh, as a result of the book, they... Uh, they learned a lot about him and about that story, and they brought this photograph to my attention. And it's and there's an amazing story tied to that photograph, and I wrote it up for uh, Smithsonian Magazine. So uh, uh, I've I've uh, really ranged pretty widely through American history and thinking about uh, you know how war happens in American society and how uh, society is affected by war. That's incredible. So for people who want to learn more about you and more about war and more about your books, where can they find more? Sure. The, well, the best place to start would be to go to my website, uh, markworkmanbooks.com. Uh, there are a number of links there to, to uh, archives of articles I've done, um, uh, interviews, uh, talks I've given, uh, and... Uh, I, and of course, more information about my books and, and other writings, um, as well as some of the sources that I've used. Um, and that's markwortmanbooks.com, and it's M A R C W O R T M A N books.com. Uh, you can also go to my Facebook page, uh, Mark Wortman Books, and uh, you know, can follow some of my doings. Uh, you know, I post when I'm going to be giving talks. I, I post on uh, things I publish, and I post on, you know, just historical events that uh, that are going on and that interest me. Um, so uh, you can go there and and click and follow what I have to say. And of course, if you want to buy any of my books, uh, go to Amazon or your local bookstore and order them. Uh, they're readily available, uh, and although I, if you can find hardcover copies of some of them, uh, grab them because they'll be collectibles. 